Welcome to Math 31. This is a lesson on the review of functions. So we'll be covering some old stuff, but also looking at things in a slightly different way. First off, the definition of a function. A function is a relation for which every value of x has only one value of y. Okay. Um, another way of looking at that is to say that no two points have the same first coordinate. And that's a little bit easier to understand, particularly in a, in a graphing context. So if we were to consider this example, we are given two relations, in this case relation t and relation u, and the question is, which of the above is a function? So I'm, the question suggests that only one of them is, but let's see what happens. Now, um, the way you identify this is basically according to that last observation. Uh, if anything has the same first coordinate, or any two ordered pairs have the same x coordinate, then they're not functions. So this one is not a function. And this one is, because if you take a look, 2, 3, 3, um, three 5, 4, 6, there's no repeat. So this is a function. Now graphically, this has implications, as I said, and we'll look at that very soon. The vertical line test for functions you uh, undoubtedly have seen before, and this does refer to a graphical analysis of a potential function. So we're going to look at a couple graphs and just to see whether these are in fact functions or not. And the vertical line test just means that you draw a vertical line through, and at any point that you do go through, you simply make sure that you only intersect in one place. So I'll just state it quite simply. You cannot intersect in more than one place. So that's okay to intersect there, there, but you cannot double up. So this is this passes the vertical line test. So therefore, is a function. Now the next one, not surprisingly, is not a function. So I at any point, so if you went through and drew a vertical line through it, that's kind of vertical, you notice how you're intersecting in more than one spot. So this is, this fails the vertical line test is not a function. So graphically, it's quite easy to tell. And it's, it's, if you take a look at the ordered pairs, we have negative 1, 9, or it looks like that's negative 1, 9, probably not quite. And then we have negative 1, negative 9. And you see the same thing is true. You have duplicate x coordinate, so it's not a function. Unfortunately, we don't do an awful lot with this, but we have to be aware whether things are functions or not. That does become an issue. move away from the graphs and get into function notation and once again you would have seen this you'd be quite comfortable with it I think if you had a linear relation like this y is equal to 2x plus 3 in function notation we simply write that as f at x or f of x and it means that x or y is a function of x so if we were doing in table of values, we'd write it as x, f at x, and just a real rough little graph, if you had that, it'd be x, and then f at x on the y-axis, sort of how that works. And any letter can be used, of course, g at x, k at x, h at x, t at x, you name it. Has a lot of advantages for substitutions and, and some of the function work that we'll be looking at later on. 
Now, mapping notation doesn't get used quite as much, but uh, we look at it here fairly quickly. And this would be an example, rather than go through a real complicated explanation of it, we, we instead of using a bracket, we use a, a colon, and we use an arrow instead of an equal sign. And this really means that the function f maps x onto y. So it's kind of clunky notation. And I'm, rather than linger on that too long, we'll get another look at it in a different sort of context. If we took a look at this, these, these are just sort of function diagrams. And the um, ellipse that's labeled x has three points in it. The ellipse labeled y has three, also three points in it. And mapping diagrams is what I'm going to call these. Not the sort of thing you'll see on an exam, but um, something you want to be aware of. Mapping diagram simply means that we'd be taking this x point and it maps onto this y point or coordinate. And then the second x point maps onto the next one. So x maps onto y. Now you could make up examples of these, like if x was 1, and in fact if we use the previous function, we could say that it maps onto 4. So let's use that. fx maps onto x plus 3. So you could pick values for x. And you'd end up getting these three points. So 1 maps onto 4, for example. So on, like that. Now this is a function. There's no repeated x coordinates. Let's take a look at another one in a few seconds and then analyze that. This one, this x point maps onto that y point. Then this x point maps onto the same, a little bit more accurate, y point. And then this x point maps onto this one. This is still a function because there's no duplicated x values. Take a look at another one. Here this x maps onto that y, then this x maps onto this different y, and then this x maps onto this y. And this is not a function because of the duplicated x values. You cannot have one x point correspond to two different y's. If you really want to get fancy with this, this very first one is a special type of function. So I'm just going to insert afterwards is a 1, 2, 1 function. 1 to 1. So that means that it's true both directions. There's no duplicate y values either for your information. Now the only other thing that you can do with these, or the only thing, other thing I'm going to do with it, is given this particular function, fx mapping onto x minus 3, and given these three specific x values, we just want to draw a mapping diagram. So it just means that if x is negative 1, if you apply the rule 
So negative x minus 3, negative 1 maps onto negative 4. Just like 0 maps onto negative 3. Just like 1 maps onto negative 2. End of story. So that's not all that important, but the next topic is, and this is interval notation, which we're going to be using a lot. So this is quite different than what we've just been seeing. Interval notation is really just an alternate way to express a set of numbers to what is commonly known as set notation. And it refers or works specifically with real number sets. And easiest, I think, to see in terms of a, of a series of examples rather than a, a definition for it, it works with brackets. So like if you had this set notation, this means negative 3 as a lower limit positive 4 as an upper limit we're talking about all the x values between negative 3 and 4 inclusive all the real numbers so that means everything all the fractions all the decimals you name it now given that that's the situation. In interval notation, we use brackets. So to indicate the lower limit, we put a big square bracket, a closed bracket, negative 3, and then a comma, and then the upper limit is 4. And these indicate what they call a closed interval. And your closed interval simply means that we are including the end points. So by using this square bracket we mean we're including negative 3 as the lower limit and we're including 4 as the upper limit. So somebody looks at this expression in set notation and they're going to know that you mean negative 3 and 4 inclusive. And then we can compare that to the next example. Negative 2 is your lower limit, x is your upper limit, and then 0. And again, the set of real numbers. Now, we're not including 2 or 0, so we write this as an open interval, which means we use round brackets. So negative 2, lower limit, 0, upper limit. And this is an open interval. So anybody looking at this will know that we're not including negative 2 or 0 in this set of numbers. The next one, 4 is the lower limit, not including, but less than or equal to 9, so we are including 9. So this is half open or half closed, if you prefer to think that way. We're not including 4, but we are including 9. So the square bracket around the, the 9, and this is, I'll refer to this as an, ha I'm a kind of a half open type of guy. So I'll include, I'll write it as half open. Now we have this situation. x is greater than 5. So our lower limit is 5, but this thing goes upwards forever. So the, what, we, what we do with that is we put the open interval around 5, and then we, to indicate that it goes forever upwards, we, indicate, we use the infinity symbol plus infinity, meaning it goes on forever, all the numbers greater than 5. And always open. for infinity. So if you're going to use the infinity symbol, it simply means it goes onward forever without bounds. And that suggests that you don't have a firm closing value, so therefore the open interval. That's just the convention with it. Kind of makes sense, too. 
And then the same thing if you had x is less than or equal to negative 1, we would treat this in a very similar way. Our lower limit is negative infinity. So you must put the signs there indicating it's going to the left on the number line. And the upper limit is negative 1, but it's inclusive. So you use the closed interval for that one. Six. This is the one you've been waiting for. If it's all real numbers, well, you can't really get much simpler than that. But there are no restrictions. So we simply write this as negative infinity to the left and positive infinity as the upper limit. And that tells everybody who is looking at this that we have no restrictions whatsoever. And then number seven will be the last one. This is where set notation or interval no, uh, notation doesn't work quite as well. We're talking about all the numbers except negative four. So we have to do this in two separate sets. Negative infinity is the lower limit going up to negative four, but not including negative four. And then we also have all the numbers above negative four. So negative four to positive infinity. And in union, this is the symbol we use. So it looks like a big U. The union of these two sets. So it's really not that comfortable. It's not, or it's not as convenient as set notation, where it's easier to say what something is not than what it is. This should take care of this material. Um, the next lesson will continue on function review, but looking at domain and range. Thank you for your time.